<laughs> recording him. Man, you know, one of the things I, I one of the things I learned about uh, going live, we did a live podcast last Friday, Thursday. You gotta watch what you say. <laughs> All right. Where? What is it? Where are today's sellers? Where are today's? So as I'm writing this, think about where they are. They're sitting in their house. There you go. All right. On vacation. So. Well, I think it's I think it's who. Right, we're going to talk about where, but it's who. So I'm going to run this because. Um, hold on a second. Okay. So who are today's sellers? I'm going to run this as a mastermind. You guys tell me, and, I'll, and we'll pepper it in. So you guys tell me who are today's sellers? Who are the people that are most likely to sell today? Throw them up. People that are relocating or moving out of relocation. Yeah. Older people. Oh, yeah. Hold on. Trustees. Oh, God. Hold on a second. I only write so fast. Here, I got older, older people. Um, re re relocation, I think, is the result of the person who's selling, yes. not necessarily because everybody's going to generally relocate, right? Yeah. So I think that's a part of it. But um, Somebody we're going to talk. So older people, I heard. Uh, bought 20 years ago or more. They bought. Okay, so older house. people in general and then uh, long term. Set long term owners, owners, right? Yeah. People okay. who need to sell their home. Life events? That's these. Yeah. Okay. Uh, three, the life events. Four, trustees. People who want to move from condos to homes. Yeah, upgrade. Um, when you say trustees, are we talking about like probate, everything with that? Like or people just... who like inherited properties? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm just going to say uh, estate sales trust. Um, what else did I hear? Something. Somebody you ask? Condos from. Condos, con uh, move up buyers, right? Yeah. Plan the idea. Which was that? Sell. Plan the idea. Ask them who you want to sell. Well, yeah, that's how we do it, right? Okay, so let's start with this group, okay? And then we'll go from there, right? So older people, let's not get older people confused with long-term owners, right? Um, actually, it's kind of funny you guys asked that, or you put that up there because I was initially asked to run this class as a senior living class. How do we talk to old people and, and convince them to move out of their house? Because how, you know, we're aging, right? And somebody who is living in a two-story house or might have other issues and stuff where it doesn't make them qualify to qualify. It's not going to be to their benefit to continue to live in that house, right? I actually used to do seminars. Um, I was being coached by Dan O'Hara. You guys know who Dan O'Hara is? Um, he's with NKW, and he's been doing uh, senior living seminars for, he's in, the, um, in Hawaii, probably for 15 years. He built his whole company around that. So we started doing seminars ourselves. Um, I will tell you the challenge with older people. I'm sure some of you have experienced this. Older people do not move fast. No. trying to convince a person who's lived in their house for 30 years and has raised their family and had all their life events and everything in it, trying to convince that person that they need to go into a convalescent home and give up their house is a very challenging conversation because that person generally says, when I leave this house, I'm going two feet first, right? They're going to live in there. So there is the option we've talked about living in place and everything else. So, you know, but as a strategy for older people, you know, one, how do you find them? Okay. Generally speaking, if it's an older person, I'm going to target, I am going to go into this long-term ownership, right? Because somebody's owned it for 30 years plus, is going to be an older person, okay? So we're kind of using the same database, but the way that we approach these two people might be different, okay? And older, you know, are they all seniors? Are they semi-retirees? Um, you know, we're going to kind of go a little bit all over because these kind of, in a way, kind of tie together. You agree? Your life events, stuff. So um, I think it's really key. One, where we find out where these people are. Easiest, easiest way to find these individuals are just pulling up a, who hasn't sold in, you want old people who haven't sold in like 30 years, 40 years, right? It's 20 plus years, fair to say. Um, if I'm simply going for older seniors, yeah. I might push that to 40. Because what's going to happen is you're going to find there's a lot of those people out there, right? You're going to get a list and you're going to have 5,000 
and that you know, we have 2 million people in this county, right? So even if you go down to a neighborhood that you're working in, um, so you get that list 30 or 40, and then the way you're going to target those older people is keep in mind, it's, it's a consistency plan. Anytime you put a marketing plan together for any one of these additional income streams, revenue streams, um, you got to really be strategic and have an ongoing consistent plan. It's not a one-time scenario, right? So if I'm going to put together a program for older people senior living, I got to give them options. I'm going to get a list of every single convalescent hospital, every single assisted living facility in the area, right? I'm going to go tour those facilities so I get familiar with them. So if I do get somebody call me up saying, hey, my mom's 90 years old, she needs to go to the facility, can you help me out? Well, if you just tell them I can help you out selling your home, but you're not giving solutions on the other side, then you're going to have, you're not going to have a leg up on people, right? So if you're going to go for those older people, educate yourself on what those solutions are for those individuals. Do your tours of the local facilities. And then start doing a mailer campaign, however you can access it. If you got their email, whatever it is, start reaching out to them with articles that are going to be appropriate to that age group. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I will say we invested probably three years to this program and we, we shelved it because we realized the runway for these people to make decisions. Let's put it this way, for three years, and we were very diligent with this, um, we might have done six transactions over the whole thing. Wow. And what, what, what's terrible when you decide to pull the plug on something like that, you've invested so much time and energy in it, you know you're building the database, mm -hmm. right? But at some point, you gotta look at your ROI and focus on the higher ROI things. Okay, so there's older people. Any other questions with senior students? Uh, no, I just wanted to mention that coincidentally, that's what we're going to do today at 1 p.m. in the role play. It's a listing presentation. To an old person? Senior. Yes, oh. exactly. So please okay. come and cool. practice if you want to target them. Cool. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. So there are companies that specialize in downsizing. Uh, yes. And I interviewed a couple of them when I was looking for my own business. So can we partnership with you? You want to, absolutely. When you're doing a senior type of program, you need to offer up all those services. You better have senior movers, yeah. right? Not just a moving company, but a moving company that specializes no, in the senior. Those are not movers. They just do the garage and do everything. The state. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah you want to partner with the state sale people. You want to partner with declutterers. You want to partner with counselors and psychology individuals, right? You want to have that. This is a huge scenario that you're taking on with seniors. It really is. But if you're going to do that, you definitely want to have all of your partners in the mix. And how do you find those partners? Uh, Google, was Google senior, senior services. There's actually an association there. It's called the National Movement Association of yes. National Move yep. Managers. Yep. What you'll find, though, when you talk to them is that they typically are hired by the realtor. So they're not necessarily going to be the, the contact that they contact you. You contact them as a resource. Right, but they'll be a great resource a great for resource. your portfolio. Yeah, so there's some Absolutely. great ones around. Yeah. Um, Brian Swatsky in our office pretty much only does this type of a program. Um, so he'd be a great person to talk to. But I will tell you just where I stand, there's a lot of higher ROI activities, ROI activities that you can do than just focusing on seniors. Right. This is when, you know, anytime you look at what pillars you're bringing into your business, right? Um, if you go to my office and you look up on our wall, we have a pillar board. We have probably 11 different pillars. And the challenge I think with a lot of agents, they'll see a pillar board like that. Like, oh, I got to have 11 pillars. No, just start with one, two, you know, do your geographical farm, your database, right? You're not going to add something like senior living people to it. Bless you. Um, you know, until you've perfected those other pillars. And then really analyze it to see is this really a pillar I want to add to my action for those sellers? Okay. Let me take a step back. Why do we want to focus on sellers? Why do you want to focus on sellers? Sellers is leverage. Business. What is that, Emory? Leverage. Leverage. Leverage, leverage for what? Yeah, for you know, you take buyers. listings, you get buyers, and you get it's kind of a listings. gold, right? It's, yeah, it's a gold mine. Right, right. Yes. Um, I think I said this last time when I was early in the business. All you do is buyers. They'll take anything that comes to you, right? Mm -hmm. And then after about two or three years, you get tired of being that tour guide, right? And you see the listing agents like, oh my God, they're not even doing their own open house. What's going on here? Look, they're doing their open house. They got all these buyers coming to them and everything, right? 
Every listing should generate two transactions for you. Mm. Our team averages, I think, one and a half per listing. Listings are the goal. That's really what you want to focus on. Um, I'll tell you, once I switched my focus on listings and sellers, that's where my business blew up. It doesn't mean that you're walking away from your buyers because those sellers will bring buyers. Mm -hmm. Right? You want a 50-50 max in your business, both sides. So, okay, uh, long-term owners. I believe right now that's the number one place that we can find sellers and sellers who are motivated to sell. Now, the pushback might be, well, Mark, how do you go to a seller who's got a 2.75% interest rate and convince them to sell right now? They got taxes that are due. I mean, you guys know the, um, um, the, the exclusion. What's the exclusion for a seller when they sell for capital gains? 250 per person or 500 if they're married, right? Yeah. You guys know that there's a bill that might change that? Yeah. So is that something you're... Is that something that might hold up your seller to say, well, wait a minute, I got a million dollar capital gain here. And if this thing gets passed, I might not have to pay taxes on that extra 500,000. So why am I going to sell right now? What's, good the, point. what's the bill? I'm not sure what the name is, but it's on the floor. I was looking for Jim or somebody. Um, Doug knows what it is. Anyways, it's, it's on the floor right now and it should be by January 1 approved. Should be. It's got a lot of backing. Do we pay more capital gains? No, less. So it'll go from 500, it'll go, from, it'll double. It'll go from 250 to 500, 500, 500 2 million. Uh, yeah. So incredible thing. But, but here's the gift. Here's the, you know, any of this stuff that we're looking for, for sellers or any client or anything, it, it, our business isn't a race, right? It's a marathon. So even if you have that seller who comes to me and says, hey, you know what, Mark? I, I can't do this right now. I mean, I might save a half a million bucks in taxes on this thing or the equivalent you know, once the, once they figure it out, you know, let's stay in contact with them. You know, do you think it would be cool monthly giving this person the update of what's happening with that bill? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. And that's going to continue to solidify you. So then six months or a year from now, they become your client. Right. So with anything, again, it's that consistency that you have to stay in front of. Them. I see these individuals, you know, take myself, my kids are in Texas. Now, if my daughter or son started having kids, where do you think my wife's going to want to go? Mm -hmm. Right? We don't need the schools here anymore. Yep. I work here. It's where my career is. But you also have this scenario. A lot of my personal clients are now empty nesters. We're selling their homes. They don't care about their 2.75% because it's a life event, which kind of falls into here. Right? Um, I do find, I mean, I, I said this time and time. How many, okay, let me ask you this question. We have 40 people here and plus online. How many of you actually have where you pull a database? of 20 years or older owners that have owned their property. How many of you guys have done that? Why hasn't everybody else done that? Judith, why haven't you done it? I have done it. I think oh, you just want to raise your hand? Yes. <laughs> okay. Sorry. So yeah, I, I asked that question because these lists are free. You guys are looking for business. Mm -hmm. If you analyze everybody who's selling their homes right now, I'll guarantee you over 50% of the sellers fall into this category. The empty nesters, right? The empty nesters, yep. semi-retirees. You know, they're going to follow. Go ahead. Where do you find this information? Go to your title company. Yeah, call right. Kevin Barrett. Tell him I want a list of every home. And, well, I did this. Mm -hmm. Give me a list of every home in Santa Clara County that are over 20 years old. Mm -hmm. that, that live their own their property for 20 years. Then I got a list of like 50,000 homes. <laughs> yeah, right? So I'm like, okay, wait. Let's, let's go to 30. Well, now it goes to 20,000. So then I said, wait a minute, Mark. You work Los Gatos and Campbell. Let's just focus on Los Gatos and Campbell. Well, now it's like 2,000, right? But yeah, that list is, is just get it from a title company. It's free information, right? Now, what you do with it is up to you, right? Is it just one-time mailer that you send out to these people? Or what would you send to these people? What would you send to these people? Information about the upcoming bill. Information on the upcoming bill? Actually, I did something you right. It's exactly that, 500 to a million, and it's a bipartisan yes. bill. Yeah, it's got a lot of support. There's a lot of hope. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, and give me the, keep in mind, you're not CPAs, well, right? No. So if you start sending out that information, you know, you might know enough to be dangerous, but have them confirm well, the other CPA. So, Mark, if you're in Los Gatos, you have to be sending the measure e flyer too, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, that's just it. Those are examples. You had a question. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say I've sent postcards like a getting ready to move on with the next phase, targeting more seniors. 
Yeah, now keep in mind, these aren't these, these people don't necessarily consider them seniors. We're not seniors. I was a little but... pissed off when I got my ARP. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, really? Yes. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. To do a little bit of research to see what the homes could be worth, and then if buyers say your home could be worth this, because they bought it for 20, 30 years ago, and they bought at like just so much equity. Absolutely. It's worth over $2 million. Right. They know they bought it. Right. So that's, that's kind of the, the marketing valuations. That's one angle you want to do, right? Do you think that some of these people might be challenged or where they're going to move to? Do you think they might be interested in what are the best states to retire in? Yeah, of right? Were those tax-free states? What does tax-free really mean? Mm. Right? And a lot of people think that if I own real estate in Texas, which is a tax-free state, I don't have to pay taxes. Mm. Unfortunately, I live in California. <laughs> California will get their money wherever it comes from. <clears throat> so figure out with these long-term owners what's going to be of interest to them. And what I what we do is we'll put together a one-year campaign, and every month it's a different subject matter. Top 10 places to retire. Top 10 places with affordable living. Somebody comes and says, let's Mark, I don't want to know where I want to live, but I want to live on a golf course. Cool. Top 10 golf course communities without, within the nation. Right? The key with any of these is be consistent. I see so many agents that walk out of a class like this. They're going to call Kevin. Kevin will call me this afternoon. Mark, what did you do? Man? I, got, <laughs> I got 50 agents calling me for these lists. And probably 2% of you will actually execute on it. It's just with the stats show. So break the stats. Come up with a plan. I'd be more than happy to sit down with anybody. Go ahead. Um, what about the owners who say, how did you get my information on where you find your In today's world, nobody really asks that. I mean, you know, if you're calling them, um, you know, I, I generally, everybody has their own opinion. Um, I'm generally somebody that I look at, do I want to be bothered? Do I want to call at eight o'clock at night from somebody? With these people, you know, today's world, they're inundated so many different ways. Um, I generally will do a mailing campaign with them and just start the dialogue and let them reach out to me. And then once they reach out to me, then I'll put it on overdrive, mm -hmm. right? Any other questions on long-term owners? No, makes sense. They're ready to go get their list. <laughs> so what's your return on your campaign to these people? That is a tough one to answer. I will tell you that For my own personal business, not the team's personal business, my own personal business, this is at least 50%. Now, they might come out of my database. You know, they, I mean, you know. You're saying the, statistically that's your sellers, right? There. Yeah, that, that's mine, that's right? And, and keep in mind, too, when you talk about, you know, I've been a geographical farmer in Los Gatos for 30 years. I mean, I have a 3,500-person farm, and then we mail 14,000 pieces that hits every single house every quarter. So for me, so, of course, am I going to, does it make sense for me to do this in Santa Teresa? No. No, I'm going to do this in Los Gatos and Campbell, mm -hmm. right? So that's where it's kind of a little bit skewed. I, I probably see better results. I personally probably see better results here with a campaign than maybe one of you would. But I go out, but it's consistency, mm -hmm. right? People just need to get to know me. Okay, um, life events. What are life events? Yeah. Um, divorce, diapers, death, death, death new baby, marriage, <laughs> marriage, divorce, divorce, a surprise kid, you know, a surprise kid. You know, it's funny um, because I've been doing here in Morocco. You guys know what is it? Smart Zip? Is that even still around? Smart Zip? Smart Zip. Probably. So you know, I've, I've been a geographical farmer. I mail out everything, and these companies always reach out to us saying, "Hey, listen, instead of blanketing the entire community, we have a uh, we have a system that could predict life events." And that means that you only have to mail out to 30% of these individuals in your farms because you're mailing it out to 100% and 70% of those people aren't going to be ready to sell. And yet every time I analyze those systems, I've seen that they cost almost as much as me doing my general approach. And I've been in the business long enough that you cannot predict life events. You can't. You just can't. Um, so where would be a great resource for plugging yourself into situations where you can benefit from individuals and life events. Uh, there's a hint up there already. County uh, database, uh, because it has all the divorce. Uh, okay, I'll say that's generally after the case, though. Yeah. Once somebody's already filed for divorce. Yeah, but they don't sell usually before they get divorced. Right, but generally by then they'll have their advisors in place. Uh, but that's, that's a good source, okay? Attorneys. Attorneys, CPAs, financial advisors, right? Council, uh, couples counseling. <laughs> yeah, right. Marriage counselors. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. 
in, in the city for weddings? Sure, right, wedding registries, all of that stuff. Diamonds, diapers, death, and divorce. There you go. I love that. <laughs> um, so yeah, attorneys, um, CPAs, financial advisors, all those people, life insurance agents, right? Life insurance. How do you connect with those people? Do you guys ever, when I first got in the business, my challenge was I'd go to these individuals and they're like, hell, I've been doing this for 15 years. I already got five agents I refer business to. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. So what's a, what's a solution behind that? Just keep me in mind. If okay. You retire. If right. It's just I'd like to be, you know, your backup. Yeah. I think that's awesome. And here's this the list of resources I can provide. One hundred percent. Yeah. Send them a packet on yourself, right? You know, in your presentation, everything, Danny. Um, I don't know if people know this, but in insurance, insurance agents just themselves. Even if you're starting, and like let's say I were to go into insurance, right? You could, if someone's retiring, that an older a person that's been doing it for. 15, 20 years, that person's retiring, they're selling that book of business yes. to somebody else. Right. So just because they're retiring, that newer agent or a life insurance person can be taking on that set of business. Right. You build that relationship with them, and now you're the first person. 100%. 100%. So stay in contact with them, right? Yeah. So the generalized approach is get a list of all of your family, attorneys, all that stuff, and just start sending them information, right? That's a general approach, just to stay in front of them. Would you agree? Right? Mm -hmm. So what I did was I realized that everybody I was coming into business with already had a relationship with brokers or agents. So I happened to be new in the business. There were other, other individuals that were new in their own industries. So I seeked out people within my group that were newly licensed um, insurance agents, CPAs, attorneys. And we set up a meeting once a month where we would get together just having coffee and help each other. How can I help you grow your business? And that was an incredible way. So over the years now, that we've stayed in contact and it's been an incredible way for us to generate business. And I didn't have to worry about waiting for the real estate agent to retire at 70 years old or so, right? So I encourage you guys to look at that. Look into your, look into your database, look into your friends, Facebook, whatever it is. Who are those same individuals who have either recently been licensed, right? Or to your point, well, Manny said, you know, somebody might be looking at retiring or something. Too. Um, another tip that when you're looking at retire, um, one of the things we did years ago, in our age, and especially now, it's probably more, I think, uh, you'd, you'd have more positive results because there's a lot of us in this business that are getting to that age that we don't want to do this anymore as much. Um, pull up licenses. You know what I'm talking about. Pull up licenses from agents that have maybe been in this business 30 or 40 years. And a lot of agents, what do they do? They just die away and go off. You see all those names in the neighborhood all of a sudden? Whatever happened to Dan Turkis? Whatever happened to David Clark? David Clark's team is still out there, right? But anyways, you know, identify, what's up, Eric? Identify some of those agents and go to them and ask them, talk to them about buying their book of business. Hey, don't just go away. Let me take over your business and I'll pay a 50% referral fee for the first two years. After that, I'll give you 25% for two. And let me work your, your clients. Anyways, just another tidbit. So life events, um, again, life events could break off into several different ways that you're going to market to these people, right? Um, and, and that's a challenge too, because how do you market to somebody who's going through a divorce? I mean, most of these are very highly emotional type situations, right? You don't want to be an ambulance chaser. There are people that, that download all the death certificates in the county and then start hitting the family. Some agents do it. I personally don't recommend it, but it's available to them. Well, one way to work that would be probably, I'm thinking out loud right now, to work it through your database. In your database, I'm, I'm sorry, it's fear of influence. People okay. that know you at a personal level. Right. So if you put out there some information hinting to the fact that you can help people going through the divorce, right. your sphere of influence, if anybody's going through that, they may reach out to you and then it's a referral. 100%. Place, right? Now, my only pushback on that is I would hope that anybody in your database would already know that, right? So definitely, because I mean, what I want to do is I want to generate business outside of that database, but you're right. You know, you got to make sure it's interesting. Again, when you first came to the business, everybody says specialize in, in a neighborhood, right? right? Specialize in something. My attitude was I want to specialize in real estate. Mm -hmm. I want to know everything there is to know about real estate so I can advise my clients the best, right? Now as a managing broker, that's very, well, I'm not a managing broker anymore. <laughs> as a managing broker, it used to be very scary to say that because you're out here pushing all these agents to, to uh, potentially create liability situations, but um 
the focus is, is there. But anyways, having the multi-prong approach. Um, the multi-what? Multi-prong, right, approach. So with life events, you're going to have all these different things come up, and you need to make sure that when you have the right partners involved that you refer your clients to, right, have the right partners involved that can refer these events to you, and then you better be educated on how to manage those type of sales. For life events, it's helpful to have your own database of like divorce attorneys you know. And Absolutely. Like that, so that when you see stuff percolating, you can say, if you need some referrals, I can give them to you. Right. Yeah. And then hopefully yeah. they come back to you. Absolutely. Is it ethical, uh, I'm not sure about legal, to, to pay referral fees for non aged people? Legally, you can only pay a referral fee to who? Licensed, licensed agents and principals in a transaction. What was the second one? Sorry. Principals in a transaction, buyer or seller in a transaction. Yeah. Or a licensed agent. That's it. That's it. That's you it. can't pay a referral fee from someone like legally. Company. Department of Real Estate. Those are the only two people that you can refer to, or pay pay a referral fee to. Period. I mean, otherwise, you're going to lose your license. There, there isn't anything called in, in production fee or. No. Please don't. No. Where's Mark Miano? No, no. I'm telling you. I'm not saying it in a bad way. Like, no, no, I'm just I'm saying, saying the, 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 the area is very, very, very strict with this. So don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it in a bad Sorry, way. Yeah. Or uh, trying to take advantage of people. Yeah. But Sometimes uh, when uh, someone knows other person mm -hmm. who's got to sell or buy, or he, uh, a cousin who has a lot of uh, clients, right. what if the other person knows about this too? Like either they can have like I'm not I'm licensed. Getting... I'm not licensed. My uncle owns half of downtown San Jose, yeah, and I want exactly. you to sell his properties, but I want ten percent of the on it. So what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, but if your uncle knows about the referral fee, or I, I can I can give the uncle all the referral fee I want, but the person yeah. who's the source of that you cannot do. Hmm. It, it, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. There's nothing to think about with this guy. <laughs> you could only give a referral fee. To a licensed yes. real estate agent or a buyer seller in a transaction. Okay. So, now, what you can do. So, what do you think? I so, kind of so I so I meet with my partner. Get something out of it. I meet with my and I'll tell you what they get out of. I meet with my partners on an annual basis. What do I ask those partners? Send me referrals. How many referrals are you going to send me this year? You know, my mortgage bro my mortgage broker, Mr. Michael Houghton. I'll sit down with him once a year. Say, Michael, I give you all my business. I know you can't give me all your business because you work with other agents. But how many referrals are you going to give me this year? Two, three, I don't care, but you're going to commit something to me. My landscaper that we refer all of our business to, Oscar, how many, how many referrals are you going to give me this year? You get all my landscape business. You get all my prep business. Well, Mark, I'm a landscaper. Well, my people aren't buying or anything right now. I don't care. Give me one or two of them. Have those conversations. That's the benefit. So I don't need to pay him a referral because I'm, I'm referring business to him, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, you, you get a, a referral from them too. Yeah, that's the win win. So, but it's not a fee. It's not a fee. It's business. Yes. Yeah. Oh, just really quick. I have a, a relationship with somebody. It's not fun. You know, I lost my son in 2012. Mm -hmm. And it was very unexpected. I had a friend who really helped me a lot to, you know, yeah. do all the funeral arrangements. And yes. That. And then after, you know, a couple of years later, my friend lost her husband. So, when she was going through the death, you know, the funeral arrangements, they call this a person that comes to the home and does the funeral arrangements yeah. directly, a broker it is. Okay. So I created a relationship with him. That's awesome. That's good. <laughs> you know, it's been hard, you know, but yeah. um, I think in a way it's a way of me of overcoming. Of course. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really uh, something that nobody thinks about. Um, these people go to the homes. Right. And so many times people, you know, they're not prepared for this and Nobody's they're not always wealthy. Right. You know? Right. So when you go through a broker, it's much cheaper. Yeah. And we just connected really well and, you know, we have a really good relationship. Nothing has happened yet, but I think that's... Um, I think that goes to the resources you can provide to your clients. And what I love what you're talking about is, you know, obviously this is career for all of us mm -hmm. and it, it pays our bills. Mm -hmm. But I have found the most gen the most 
genuine way that you can earn an income is by helping others mm -hmm. and doing it because you follow your own beliefs, mm -hmm. right? I see so many agents that will go join volunteer organizations and stuff or groups. And it's like, just to get the business out. Mm -hmm. It's the wrong way to do it. Yeah. When your client started by at, at CD, because all of this stuff where the sellers come from, this is a lot of information that we need to know, right? But, but the more we need to know this, we're the advisors to be able to sit down with them. So do you think in that situation where Anna Maria is talking about where, you know, God forbid she has to go deal with a client who's lost a loved one, she can say, listen, I'm so sorry about this, but I've got somebody who, who can come in here and help you out. Would that not be a benefit to the client? Yeah. So the point with that is really recognize whatever, wherever, wherever you're getting your sellers from, what's that, what are you going to have to bring to the table to help that seller out? What about the, for churches, for nonprofits, like you made the donation uh, if someone comes through them? For the so that's state. a very sticky situation. You'll see this a lot of times where agents will say, hey, um, from a church, for example, yeah. any person that comes to the church, I'm going to donate 20% to the church. Yeah. Um, is that illegal too? There's a, there is a proper way of doing it and the non-proper way of doing it. If they are a principal in your transaction, and you're going to donate 20% of, you're going to, you're going to have to do it in their name. They're the ones who are donating it. Yeah. Okay. So that's just the way you do it. So can you do it? Yes. There's a legal way to do it. If any of you have any interest, come and see me or Mark Miano. I'll walk you through the right way to do it. Good. But you can't do that. All right. Any other questions on life units? Just as a quick plug. I know we were talking about the vendor connect earlier. Yeah. Um, that is so, so valuable. So as they're getting this going, I'm just asking publicly for everybody to just participate in that because yeah. it not Huge. only is helpful to be able to help people, but it also helps us keep people moving the ball down the field towards selling their house. Right. Yeah. So I've had situations where I have introduced people, they actually did business with the vendors and all that. Um, and then even people will bring up stuff. And then if the, the vendor list is in shambles right now, right? Yeah. So there are people who are like, oh, we just got out of probate. Man, we just have so much stuff. It's just so much to deal with. To be able to say, hey, I, to say with confidence, I have a list. I have trusted vendors that I can suggest for you to work with. Would that be helpful for you? Damn right, it's going to be helpful for them, right. Right? right? So just while we're getting that going again, please everybody participate in that because it helps everybody in 100%. this office and it makes also this office much more stronger. Um, I, I, I will. One of the challenges with that, I'll say, is that you know I've got my go-to people I use. And I don't want them to get too busy because I want to know that when I call, they're going to come oh. to me, right? So, um, you know, with that, one of the cool things with our office, I think we're more collaborative than anything. And you'll find that we're more willing to share those things. But I will say, just as a word of caution, yes. if you've got that prime person who you're running ragged, yes. yeah. just be aware of it. Mm -hmm. uh, to your point, we used to have, years ago, it was really awesome. We actually created our own Yelp page for our vendors. And it was cool. Agents were able to go in there and make notes and like rate them with stars and stuff. And then the thing got hacked and oh we were able to do. so something we're thinking about redoing as well. Yeah. But but definitely we want you guys to fill up that vendor connect. It helps us, helps everybody out. Um, other life events could be financial related, right? Bankruptcy, those types of things, right? Uh -huh. So um, what I would encourage you guys to do too. Oh, is, no, this is up to yeah, well, okay. Well, that's what we'll, <laughs> I'll talk about that in a second. Um, uh, so when you're, if you're wanting to compile a database of attorneys where you're going to start soliciting to them and just, they may already have their, their, um, advisors themselves or anything, but at least get you in contact with them and stuff is pull up, you know, family attorneys, um, bankruptcy attorneys, probate attorneys, all of that type of scenario. But again, realize what each component brings to the table. If you're dealing with somebody going through bankruptcy, they might not be hundred percent up on top of their mortgage payments, right? So you need, to, you need to be aware of those types of things of how do you handle that situation or what type of bankruptcies are in. So you need to educate yourself on that. With probate, you need to educate yourself what's the difference between a probate that requires court confirmation that doesn't require court confirmation, right? Um, and is it a trust sale? Who's been the administrator? Uh, a lot of times we'll have agents come in, they're going to sign a listing card because let's say this. Um, I call up, dad just died. Um, I need you to sell the house, right? Well, hey, great. Let's sign the listing contract. Do I have the authority to do it? No. So you got to get a copy of the trust. Mm -hmm. Right. So those are all things you got to know about when you're going down these roads with specific type of sellers you're dealing with. And there's a certification for all of them. <clears throat> there is. I always love it when I get that business card and there's like 
A, B, D, E, F, all the way across the front. I saw a billboard the other day, big billboard, and in front of the guy's name, it's CNE. Now, I know what CNE is. Do you guys know what that is? Yes, yeah, Certified Negotiations Expert. Do you think the consumer knows what CNE is? No. <laughs> but yes, there's incredible programs that you can learn this stuff from, and I encourage all of that. Um, estate and trust, I mean, we kind of, oh, you want to talk about notice and defaults you brought up. Yeah. Foreclosures are not happening anytime soon in our area. But there's always some. Well, there's like one <laughs> right now. I'm working yeah. on one. You're working on an REO? Not REO, but it's a... For your client that's in default? Yeah. How are you managing that? Uh, well, he's trying to um, get a loan modification. Okay. But he's been trying for like a whole year. Does the bank open to a short sale? Uh, yes, potentially. So we're okay. hopefully going to list it. So again, you get, some of you might be saying, what's a short sale? <laughs> right? Or what it even is a notice of default? Um, those are all things you need to learn if you're going to go down that road, right? Mm -hmm. um, if we're talking notice of default as far as like actual <coughs> foreclosures, yeah. it's going to be a while until we see that where I would recommend. I mean, listen, I manage the highest amount of REO database between 2008, 2011. We were doing 40 homes a month. Yeah. Um, that fax was a fax machine. That's all it was back then. <laughs> fax machine was just humming. Yeah. It was really cool. You didn't have to go to listing presentation. You heard that fax machine go out. Oh, great. We got another sale. Um, and even with my experience with it, I'm not focusing on foreclosures right now. I think it's going to be a very, very long time until we start seeing anything like that happen. Okay. Um, so with state and trust, I mean, we kind of dealt with this. Best place to attack that is, again, with your attorneys, CPAs, insurance agents, those individuals that are very close to those clients. Any questions on the state of trust or how to manage that? You know, I, I'll tell you the biggest challenge we have when we say trust, my wife and I have a trust that our property's in. When I go to sell it, is that a trust sale? Yeah. It is. It is. If uh, my father-in-law passes away and it's in a trust, is that a trust sale? Mm -hmm. What's the main difference between those two? One's a living trust and the other one is whatever. By death, right? Are there different requirements for those two? Yeah. Yeah. Right? If somebody died, they're exempt from a lot of disclosures and everything, right? So those are the biggest things to understand. You know, what are the difference between these scenarios? Manny, just a side note, now that you're saying trust, uh, I had a, an escrow that I, I closed last year, uh, towards the end of the year, and uh, everything was going fine. The trustee that was the appointed trustee for the trust was the only person that was in charge of the trust. There was no person that's going to take over the trust if he had died. And we did not know this. Uh -huh. Two days before the seller was supposed to sign seller documentation for the sale, goes into a coma oh, and then dies. And we couldn't close six months. We had to wait six months. And obviously, we got in contract in April. Yeah. We couldn't close until November or December yep. of last year. So, just also when you guys talk, when taking on a trust like that, making sure all that documentation is, is something. Yeah, that's a great point because I, I'm taking over my uncle's trust and he actually had his older brother be the trustee. Well, his older brother is almost 90 years old, right? So those are all things to look at. Divorces too. I'm going to tell you guys a, a, a really thing to watch out for. Let's say you have a, a friend of your friend, couple of yours coming to you saying, you know, Anne Maria, I want you to sell her house. You know, uh, Jill and I have decided to sell her house. It's amicable. Everything is cool. Will you sell her house for us? And you sign a listing contract. Now what happens if you sell the house, we're in contract and a week before, I happen to find out that Jill was having an affair on me more than she did before. You think that might piss me off? Yeah. And I'm not going to go through with the sale? Yeah. How do you avoid that? Denise? We are, so we split. Now we're a couple, but I would have in your back pocket another agent. Typically, I take the divorcee because this has happened to us a couple of times. We're in contract and all of a sudden it does not become pleasant. Yes. And so we actually split, separate communication. Jim takes the, usually the husband, I take the wife. And that way we can complete the transaction without them communicating directly in Jim and I. So okay. if you're in a situation, I would just at least, depending who you are, have another agent in your back pocket so that you can help separate communication. You can tell them, yeah. bring them in, kind of amend the contract. And then that way you can at least close and finish the so I do it a little differently. What I do legally, and I, I have a couple right now coming to me saying, hey, we're in a divorce. Everything's cool. We just need to sell the house. I want to have a divorce degree. I need to have something from one of your attorneys that's confirming that this house is going to be sold. Because that's happening to me before. A week before close of escrow, 
Husband gets pissed off at the wife, and everything's cool, but all of a sudden, you know, they're looking at other assets, or they're looking at something else, and now they're not going to go through with the sale. Creates a huge liability for everybody, including myself, my brokerage, the buyer, the seller, all the way around. So I, I won't, and even in this case, but Mark, we're totally cool. Everything's all hunky-dory. It's awesome. No, get your attorneys. I want you guys to have an agreement. I want it signed. I want it recorded. Give it to me so that way we know when we're selling this house, we're selling the house. Something to know, right? I mean, because so you start working for divorce attorneys, you go down that road, next thing you know, something like that pops up. It won't be a good thing for you. All right, anything with the state and trust? Other questions? Cool. Move ups. We're not seeing too much of that happening right now, right? I mean, I think that's the biggest challenge. I mean, although it's a reality because it could be a life event. Yeah. I mean, somebody's living, you know, uh, first time home buyers buy a two bedroom and all of a sudden they got three kids running around. You know, they don't have the choice to set out that interest rate. They're going to want that move up scenario. Yeah. Or right? the kids start going to start school. So, yeah, right. So, the number one thing I, I look at moves in again, how many of you guys actually have a farm for condo development? Yeah, condos. How many of you actually have a farm? Okay, with a condo development? Yeah. Okay, so there's about 10 hands in here. Condos are the easiest way to start your career off for a farm and also to find these move-up buyers. Okay, I'll tell you why. So I mail out to 14,000 homes here in Los Gatos. I mail out monthly to 3,500 homes. Do you think I touch one condo? I don't. I don't. A lot of condos are the easiest place for new agents to start farms. Be the condo king or queen. Who cares? Those things sell like crazy and, and they're good to get in. Those people are transient. So if you don't have a solid farm, I, I get agents coming in here, I'm going to start farming Las Gatas. Do you live here in Las Gatas? Because I do. Greg Simpson does. Joe Piazza does. Bill Lister does. We've been here for 30 years. Welcome to the club. But it's going to probably be a hard one to crack into. <laughs> right? I can tell you, none of us farm to any of these condos around here. And I don't know any of these condos that have a strong farming agent in them. Okay, same thing with any of the major things in Campbell or anything else. And I don't look for the brand new ones. I look for the ones that are 30, 40 years old, right? Um, anything else on move up? So, uh, for the condo, um, um, do you mean by it's the brand new developments or uh, the so one that Question on condos, are they brand new developments or just in general? Yeah. I prefer the older ones. Because the brand new ones, we know a buyer's going to stay in those for these five to seven years, maybe even longer nowadays. So now I might target, the problem is if you target a new one, just now, if I lived in it, I would always do it. Everybody should be farming their neighborhood or their building and whatever, right? Because they're going to see on a regular basis. For the purposes of the highest ROI, I'm going to go with those condos where I know people have lived in there for a long time. I'm also going to analyze what developments have the highest amount of sales in it. You want at least a 10%, 8 to 10% of sale activity in there, right? So you want to analyze that. You want to analyze who the agents are in that area. Is there an agent who has the control over it or hold over that condo place? But you're going to find, I mean, look at Campbell. I mean, 50% of that community are condos and multi-residential. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of opportunities right underneath your footsteps. But right? how do you differentiate like uh, apartment building or condos or like, how do you mine your data? In title that company, story? title companies title give that to you for free all day long. I can go to a title company and say, I want condos that are from 1,000 to 1,500 square feet that are 20 years old or old. They do that? 100%. Mm -hmm. 100%. Manny? Since you were talking about this earlier, uh, especially with Campbell and what you were doing with the older people uh, yeah. farm, at what point do you get to figuring out the ROI? It, whether it's beneficial for you to continue or to end? Great, great question. Any of the, so we'll meet as a team and we'll decide, although my team just left, huh? they said they're going to sit here the whole time. <laughs> yeah, about, we'll sit down and we'll get somebody to come up with an idea. Hey, we want to start a new, a new venture, right? We'll analyze the amount for the budget that we have to do. And generally speaking, it depends if it's a mailing campaign or if we're just going like with long-term owners and it's a combined. But um, if it's a mailing campaign, like we want to pick up a new farm area, it's going to be 18 to 24 months. That we're going to expect to see a return and we're going to budget it out and then we'll track the roi um generally speaking we'll, anything that we do that's new we'll, we track the roi on it and we'll give it i'll give it anything a minimum of six months so are you looking at the roi as in dollar amount percentage wise return on investment well i know but like what percentage is that for you in your business currently so if it's like is it 
let's just say you spend twenty thousand dollars right on on in 24 yeah I, I better see a 5x return on that right i mean i know i'll be losing money for the six months or so i'm willing to do that but um yeah i better see a 5x return than anything we do yeah i mean we do spend on our 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 just to run our team is about a half a million a year and that's all marketing our marketing budget is probably twenty thousand, twenty to thirty thousand. yeah it's, you know but the roi is there right, right? Now, the challenge with that is you'll sit there and say, gosh, I can start farming Las Gatas. Average price points Las Gatas is 2.5 million bucks, which means the average commission is around $75,000, right? So I'll go spend 75 grand on one year because if I get one sale, I'll break even. Well, you need more than one sale because that's not an ROI. That's just a break even, right? Um, and that's the problem I see as agents we get into. We're always looking for that silver bullet. And then, of course, the salesperson will say, oh, you only need one sale. Come on, man. We guarantee you 10 leads. Just give us $2,000 up front. We'll guarantee you those two, 10 leads. We, you guys hearing a lot about 72 sold? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. Our team has two seats. So we paid 3,000 mm bucks. -hmm. One lead disconnected phone number. Oh, wow. So now the company feels bad. The company is sending us other leads that they're generating. I'm like, wait a minute. How are you generating leads that aren't coming to me? Yeah, right. You're right. And those leads they're giving us, which they've given us two, well, they have, has already been on the commercial, has, has already been on the market. So I'm just saying, even something like that that's heavily promoted by KW, just be careful. Of it, right? Talk to people who've done it before you, see what the returns are, and just analyze if it's something you want to jump into or not. We're giving up 72 sold, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we have a few minutes left. Any other questions, answers? Did you guys get something out of today? Yeah. yeah. Did we follow the... Yeah. Who are today's sellers? Okay, cool. Questions? Go ahead, Judy. So what would be your advice after everything we've talked about and all the cool things and good things we can do for a solo agent that only has a certain amount of hours every day? And like, yeah. I want to execute everything. Of course, that's the problem, right? And yeah. I do have an assistant, so it's yes. not that I don't have help. But what would be your advice in terms of, okay, Pick one, pick two, yeah. dedicate yeah. these amount of hours. So database, yeah. obviously, right? I mean, for one, again, when I first got into business, I think I even still have this. I had a, I had my business plan mapped out where I was working 50 hours a week and I would see Monday through Friday, everything I was doing. I would dedicate two hours for door knocking, two hours for lead prospecting. And it was just like a, a, a job. You have to look at it that way, right? As far as the pillars, database, that's number one, guys. Right. We analyze this all the time, even on my team. We'll do 105 transactions last year. 90 of them were from our own databases, which does say, so why the hell are we spending 20 grand a month on marketing? <laughs> because we're, we're, we're investing and in expanding our database. That's why we do it, right? Databases, number one, get a farm. I don't know how many, how many, I don't know how many agents that don't even have a farm or they're farming the community they don't even live in. That blows my mind. And I know there's a lot of you in this room like that. So get a farm, database, those are the first two. And then until those start generating a solid ROI for you, you know, don't go into anything else. I mean, yeah, you got to open houses and those activities don't cost you anything, but don't start 72, sold, Zillow, all that shit. Perfect those first two pillars before you move on. Those pillars should be able to generate enough to survive in this valley, right? Thank uh, you. Sam, do you have a question? Well, I just, I Question for you. I mean, you suggested farming condos, but like, for example, my neighborhood, you farm it. Okay. Andy C farms it. Bill Lister lives <laughs> around the corner from me. So it's kind of like, do you waste your money trying to break into your own neighborhood? Personally, I would because yeah. you're in that neighborhood more than I am. Yeah. My postcard might be in their box once a month, but you're there every single day. There, there's a guy, Hadi Kafari. You guys know Hadi? So, yeah. So I, I started with Contemporary Realty. Hadi was there. He was there for about five years. And Hadi did all this business in the Silver Triangle or in Saratoga. I was like, Hadi, how do you, how do you get all the business? You did five years into it. He goes, I jog every morning and every person I see in my neighborhood, I smile at them and everybody knows who I am. So, I mean, I'm not, for your situation, absolutely I would. Okay. Yeah, because again, you're there every single day. Just remember when you farm, it's not just sending out postcards. It's being involved, yeah. right? Do your shredding days, support the local school. Be involved in that community, not just to get the business because it's your home, the business will follow. Right? Good question. I was going to ask 
going to add on to that because um, right now um, I've been doing a lot of open houses in my hometown, which yeah. is so nice. Awesome. Uh, Tom's listing right on Depot Hill. Very cool. Yeah. It's thin. And a lot of people, I did like coffee and donuts for the neighborhood. Over 40 houses came. Awesome. Uh, they, Tom had a sign saying, coming soon, coming soon. So I was already out in the neighborhood doing yeah. all the stuff. And they're like, so he's from Saratoga and he's from, and they were really like Santa Cruz locals. Or locals locals. only. They're like, all these houses that the fifth own house i'm like i'm born and raised here I'm yeah here absolutely I, and then uh, all the open houses like people are really big on do your neighborhood be here and i'm like that's why i'm here yeah, um, that's you awesome know, like, i could walk to the school up the street like and people really love it's them. very hard to trump local knowledge right chuck yeah. <laughs> 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 said it's hard to trump local knowledge very hard, How's the market, chuck? Unbelievable. <laughs> there you go. All right, guys, we're kind of at the end. Is there anything else? I mean, we got a few more minutes. Thank you, Mark. I guess for, for the move-ups, besides condos, like how would you identify whether like demographically or long term? Right. So I, you just look at how long. Yeah, I might look at somewhere. smaller. Yeah. You know, that, that's a little more analytical. Yeah. I mean, you're going to find that you can do that. Yeah. But I would just start. Get your pillars in place, get those going, and then you can start diving in a little bit more on the move ups and stuff. Because what's going to happen is if you're focused on your database, if you're focused on you know your open house, all that other stuff you're doing, um, you probably won't have time to dive too much. Deeper. That'd be a great video. <laughs> all right, cool guys. Thank you guys. Love you now.